good afternoon and welcome to our first module in the Coming to the Table, a pediatric primary. Mary Care Healthy Weight Initiative for Children and Families. My name is Elizabeth Breidenbach. I'm a meeting and event specialist based in the Clinical Affairs Division here at NAC, and I'm pleased to bring you this event along with my division colleagues. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping announcements. You have joined this online event. This event is being recorded, so joining this recording, this is our little disclaimer about Zoom on the front of your screen. By joining this session, automatically consents you to this recording. If you feel uncomfortable or you do not want to be recorded today, we'd ask that you kindly leave today's session. Again, today's session is being recorded. You have joined by either physically calling in or using computer audio. Either option is completely fine. We do recommend, though, if you're in an area or a Wi-Fi can be sometimes a little bit spotty. It's best to use the call-in feature so you can hear the entirety of today's event. You do have the ability to mute and unmute yourself throughout today's session, as well as share video. We do recommend throughout today's session that you do keep your line muted. This is really just to avoid any sort of background noise interference. Um, and then again, the video is open and we, we encourage you to use that throughout today's session or today's module. We will be primarily sharing PowerPoints, but throughout the, the modules in the near future, again, will be an, an opportunity to share video as well. Chat box is okay, open, uh, located um, on in the corner of your screen. Feel free to open that, type your comments, questions, or concerns and into that box at any time. We'll be directing majority of today's questions at the end of today's session or segment, um, my apologies. Um, but again, that chat box is open and I thank you for all of those comments that are coming in from where you guys are working from today. I really appreciate that. Friendly reminders, today's event is being recorded. Please keep your audio line muted. And again, the chat box is open for the duration of this event. At this time, I'm gonna I'd be turning things over to Jenny McLaurin, who's going to be today's moderator and taking it from here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Liz, and welcome, everybody. Welcome to our table. This is our very first session of five. We hope you'll be able to join for all of them. And we fashioned this around the idea of coming to a table together, to gathering and understanding together how we might best approach the topic of pediatric weight from a health perspective, focusing on the family and the community. And of course, the community health center is central to that topic. Um, there will be, this will be recorded as Liz said, and there's resources at the end and we have some follow-up resources that we can send you to. And just one quick shout out, I saw somebody was from Clayton, North Carolina. I lived there when I worked at a community health center in Eastern North Carolina, the beginning of my career. So way to go, Clayton, North Carolina. Next slide. So we're setting the table in module one. We're really just gonna get through screening. We're not talking about treatment, intervention, that sort of thing. Those are later modules. So today we're setting the table for approaching this whole huge topic. And as we begin, we're gonna think about why we're here and what sort of work we do. And then what's on our plates? What are we actually looking at? Who's gathered around our table? What in the world are we trying to serve up? How do we prepare that meal? And then what's next? Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of chefs in the kitchen. So I happen to be the one speaking, but there's a lot of people working on this. And this is uh, the fourth year of a project that uh, was funded by the CDC as a cooperative agreement. And it has a number of spokes to it. This learning series is one spoke. Sarah Price uh, that you see pictured there is our fearless leader at NAC. She is the program director over all of these um, topics. I really am just involved in this learning series and some other things. I'm a pediatrician and I'm a senior fellow at NAC in public health innovation and integration. I also have many years of experience working in community health centers. Jessica Wallace is a wonderful colleague who is expert in team-based care and interventions at the center level. She is a physician assistant at Denver Health. She's been involved as a um, contractor with this program for a number of years. She really is an expert in her field and she will be presenting um, towards the end of these modules. And um, Jessica's getting a doctorate at this point as well. And then Naomi Smith is uh, our fearless manager specialist of um, all, all of this uh, project and has helped us um, make sure that this actually happens in an organized manner. Um, and 
looks a lot better than anything that I could create. So many thanks to Naomi. Next slide. We're gonna start each session with what we call a meaningful work moment. We all know that we have lived through and are continuing to live through some of the most difficult health uh, care times in any of our lifetimes. And um, so we don't wanna just be talking heads, giving a bunch of information out. And in each module we'll have a moment um, that we can reflect on our own work and our own calling in healthcare. And also it's shaped towards the topic of the module. So it's something that you can then take back to your community, to your patients, to your staff, and hopefully um, help all of us have um, a little more joy in our work and more, um, yeah, just a healthier approach. So this first one, we're just gonna talk about three types of sign. And this is something that I learned I didn't know this year. And um, evidently there's sort of three major types of sign. There's the stress sigh, I'm sure all of us have done. <sighs> there's the relief sigh. <sighs> and there's the contentment sigh. <sighs> And I want you to think about what you're bringing to our table today. Which kind of sigh are you bringing? As we start, and this again is something that you can do with your families, your patients, your staff, we're gonna do the relief and the contentment sigh in order three times. And that actually restores our wellness and gets us ready to be fully present. So it, You'll do this with me, I'll model it. We're gonna do it three times in a row. Relief, <sighs> contentment. <sighs> Relief, <sighs> contentment. <sighs> Relief, <sighs> contentment. And we'll learn as we go forward that that vagal exercise actually does have a lot to do with our well being and does affect our um, obesity status. Next slide. So what's on our plates that we're looking at today? And I know just, I had a quick preview of who's on. Uh, I didn't look at it too carefully, but I know that although many of you are clinicians, not all of you are, and some of you are in PCAs and you're looking at this as whether it's uh, a topic that you want to share further. Um, so what, what exactly are we talking about in these modules and what's the problem? Well, the problem is that childhood overweight and obesity affects a quarter of our children right now in preschool, age two to five. These are usually the little kids who are running around free and are not sedentary. And that's quite alarming. The rate of monthly BMI change almost doubled for children and adolescents in the pandemic, and it's continuing to rise. We think that 2030 isn't that far away, folks, eight years, 17 million children with obesity, and I'm not talking overweight, obesity. Despite that, uniform screening, prevention, and treatment for pediatric overweight and obesity is extremely limited in primary care settings, and that includes even private pediatricians' offices. But we know that it's limited in community health centers as well, even though there has been strong United States um, preventive, preventive Services Task Force recommendations, which you have as resources here, um, on how to address this. And it was interesting today, Kaiser News had a headline that said, um, I'm gonna look at it. It said, almost like malpractice, to shed bias, doctors get schooled to look beyond obesity. And it was a, it was a critical article on how inequipped we are as physicians, um, and I guess generally healthcare providers to address this and how our bias and our stigma gets in the way, which we'll talk about in module two, but also how in medical school education, only 10% of medical school educators said that they felt that their medical students were, um, had a good education in the management of overweight and obesity, only 10%. So we don't have people coming out of training knowing how to address this. And those of us who've been in training for a while really struggle. There are long waiting lists for weight management specialists. There really aren't as many as we need. And um, there really aren't very many options for people outside primary care, particularly pediatrics. 
We know all of us in community centers, health centers, hopefully are well-versed in social determinants of health or social drivers of health. You can call it whichever you want. Um, but we know that it's, it's not that people just eat too much because they don't have anything better to do, but that there's, there's huge social drivers of uh, overweight and obesity. We also know that right now the United States is in a mental health emergency, a mental health crisis in pediatrics and adolescents, and um, that mental health and physical health are intertwined in this epidemic. They're really not separable. Next slide. So as we go through these modules, we're not gonna be looking at it as an individually treated patient in the exam room sort of experience. We'll do a little bit of that in module three. We'll specifically talk about the medical management in the exam room. And we have some wonderful folks who do that um, as a part of their everyday work who are gonna be speaking with us as experts for us in community health center settings. Um, but as we look at this, we really need to see that behind that one child whose BMI is out of control, that there's a whole background there. And it starts with the family and then it goes to their community. And it's not a one point in time. So um, we really need to think about overweight and obesity as a chronic disease. And just like any chronic disease, we don't just have one visit and it all works out. It's longitudinal and it varies over time. And there's a number of comorbidities that go along with this. Um, I don't think many of us really looked at overweight and obesity as a chronic disease before, um, at least I didn't. Um, and um, there's some argument around whether that's true, but I think looking at it along with the comorbidities is really important. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> this slide, um, has a lot of information on it, but the things that we need to know is that the numbers are worse with age. Almost 40% of US adults are obese uh, currently. Um, if we include overweight, more than half of us in the US are overweight or obese, so it is the norm. Um, twice, um, I talked about the 25% the of two to five year olds, but over half of school children now with obesity are gonna to continue to be obese as adults um, if nothing else changes. We talked about the social determinants of health and I'll go into more detail on them, but food security, of course, and that seems paradox paradoxical, but we'll talk about it. The built environment, where the children live, what they have access to, how they can move around, um, what happens in the school setting, certainly in the pandemic, things got a lot worse and we realized how important the school setting is for our children's health, transportation, um, daycare, and it's not just daycare, but it's also early in education. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and of course, uh, culture, race, and ethnicity. And there's important um, determinants that we need to be aware of and uh, avoid stigma and bias as well. So, I think almost all of us by this point know that obesity is considered an independent risk factor for severe COVID, but that's true in pediatrics as well as adults. And that family stress contributes to weight gain in general and to poor nutrition. Some of the chronic comorbidities that we'll talk about more in session three are asthma, depression, anxiety, diabetes, anuresis, it just goes on and on, joint pain, slip capital, femoral epiphysis, which I have seen in practice. I wonder how many of you have um, sleep apnea. We do see a lot. And of course that also affects um, ability to do well in school and things like ADHD sometimes. Um, all kinds of GI complaints, abdominal pain, constipation, um, problems with periods fatigue, headache, hypertension, and sadly, we are seeing quite a bit of fatty liver. And the cost is huge, $14 billion in children, $190 billion in the US on obesity-related conditions. Next slide. So you could have a whole session on just understanding the effect of stress on obesity, but um, you know, we ask about people say, oh, well, um, I just get stressed, I eat. Well, there's actually physiological reasons for that. Um, it is an appropriate physiological response to stress because it is what our body is telling us to do. So as we have increased stress, we increase our cortisol 
and that makes our liver make more glucose. And then we get a higher abdominal fat deposition, which is um, one of the measures of obesity is um, looking at waist circumference. Um, anxiety can increase impulsive eating for many, not for all. But one of the important things that we look at in children too is the quality of sleep that they're getting because um, stress decreases that sleep quality and increases their insulin resistance. And higher parent perceived stress has been shown in the literature to be linked with higher childhood obesity. So it, it can be, even the slide is stressful to look at, um, you know, but I mean, I think I have felt that way. I'm sure many of you have felt that way um, in your days. And uh, I want you to just think for a bit. Next slide, we're gonna do a little poll on how you respond to stress. I think we have four questions for you. Yeah, how you respond to stress. You eat more, eat less, sleep more, sleep less. Oh, the other eat more isn't. It's supposed to be eat more and sleep more, I think. It's just, or do an other. So you can check, check that out. Do your little response to the poll. It's all anonymous, of course. And we'll give you about five seconds and then we're gonna see the answers. All right, Liz, what do we have? So there you go. Most of us eat more, sleep less. There you go. And what is that doing? It's really messing up our insulin resistance and our glucose control. Um, and I, I fit into that category too, with my stress. Um, absolutely, man, I am a, carbs are my friend when I am stressed. All right, next. Knowing these sorts of things can help us with our patients too, where we can build some rapport and have some relationship. And we'll talk about some of that in motivational interviewing in the next module. So there are very straightforward national recommendations that are supposed to guide our practice. Um, in 2007, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out recommendations that Bright Futures linked in with. And we are supposed to annually screen all children age two and up with a body mass index. There are problems with the body mass index in pediatrics, and we do know that. Um, we don't typically also do abdominal girth. That's more accurate when we include that. Um, we don't really check for adiposity, but we use body mass index as a rough guide. Um, so it is what it is. Zero to two, we do weight and height and changing weight velocity. We have tiers of care. And what that means is that we're looking at healthy weight, well, underweight, healthy weight, overweight, obese, severely obese. And we'll show you a chart on that in a second. Um, and there's different approaches depending on where the child is in that tier of care. I know from working in community health center that I had a little checkbox on my well child screens and it was, did I counsel on weight counseling and nutrition? And we checked yes. And we may or may not have, and we may or may not have done much. Um, and then did our BMI get recorded? And if so, then we were good to go. Um, it actually didn't mean a whole lot in terms of what was done. In 2017, um, the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendations came out, included lab information and um, some community um, uh, oriented intervention and actually what what is the evidence base on what actually works? What we're gonna find out is that what actually works once you've gotten to overweight and obesity requires you to really pay attention to this as a chronic disease because it takes many, many hours. So we're gonna focus a lot on prevention. And then when we get to intervention, we're gonna focus on how do, you, how do you possibly manage those many, many hours as a community health center practitioner. Um, in 2017, the National Academies of Medicine noted that what also really, really works has to be in multiple settings and that it re really requires a village, thus come to the table, um, that child care centers were important factors, schools were important factors, clinician offices and communities. 
And so that is the focus of these modules. Um, we are not doing this just as thinking heads in an exam room. We really, really rely on those multiple settings. Next slide. So this is from the CDC, um, preventing the progression of pediatric obesity. And I think the important thing on this is just to see that primary prevention takes up 50% of the slide. Um, so it's vital. Um, by the time we get to secondary prevention, we're talking about um, somebody that already is obese, uh, BMI over 95 and under 99. Um, so that is obese, the orange. The high risk over on prevention is overweight. That's the BMI over 85 and under 95. So we really wanna stay in the green. And if we get into that yellow, we need to understand how we get back to the green. And that's the focus of most of what we're talking about. But um, once we get over to that far red, then we need uh, folks like Dr. Reifenberg who's on, and he is gonna be talking to you in module three, but that's where we get into the real uh, pharmacological and surgical kind of intervention, as well as really intensive care. Um, in the secondary ones, secondary prevention, we do get into more lifestyle management kind of care, um, and we really need to have strong community linkages, which we'll talk about. Next slide. So um, hopefully most of you have seen this in your practices if you're clinicians, but it's the quick uh, grid that shows us where we are, whether we're where we wanna be. And it's nice for parents to see this. I always show parents because it's so pictorial. So red is severe obesity. You know, it's way up there off the top. Um, down at the bottom is underweight. And I have to say, I was very well-trained for underweight in my pediatric residency. I knew what to do. I know all about failure to thrive and I know all about all the endocrine and other sorts of possibilities and neglect and everything else. Um, making up milk formulas wrong. Um, but I wasn't trained well for overweight. In fact, we didn't even care. Um, we didn't really care till they were obese. Um, and so overweight is in that yellow part. And then, um, uh, like I said, obesity is, is up in the, um, up in the red. And then severe obesity has its own, um, red is obesity and severe obesity, but severe obesity has its own grid. Um, I made a statement to our CDC colleagues that I don't ever really do anything in clinical practice that's different if I see somebody with obesity or severe obesity, because I'm trying to get them help. Um, I might be a little more desperate if I have somebody with severe obesity try to get them into a real endocrine program or maybe even into surgery if a uh, surgical consult. But um, severe obesity is um, you're, oh, you're greater than or equal to the 120th percentile of the 95th percentile, okay? So your percentiles upon percentiles and you can see that. Next slide. Hopefully most of you are gonna intervene long before anybody gets there. So traditionally who we've talked about in the um, US Presented Services Task Force reports have been um, kids six and up was where the evidence base has been around intervention. The AAP has talked a lot about two and up. Um, there are new guidelines coming out in the fall that we hope will um, include zero to two year olds. But um, for our purposes, we are, we're committed um, in community health centers to the whole lifespan. And we're committed to really looking at zero to two-year-olds because the evidence shows that um, acknowledging healthy eating habits in those first two years of life are critical to prevention of overweight in age two to five um, and do have an impact um, on lifelong health. So we will talk about that, even though most of the program interventions are geared towards school age. Next slide. The other thing that um, I don't know if you all are familiar with, but the way that we model our interventions, and we're hoping that you will, as you go forward and take what you can take from this for your own centers, is modeling um, your interventions on a human-centered de design. 
So what does that mean? We've had all kinds of things like patient-centered home, all kinds of little slang things or monikers that we hang our hats on and get excited about. And um, how is this one important or different? And basically it's saying that I may be doing an obesity clinic and I may have six um, children come in to me that day, but they're not all the same. And my response to them, even if I only have 15 minutes, should be designed and adapted around um, what we're calling um, the persona. And within a health center, obviously you've got individuals, but you also have some sort of archetypes, right? So I know that if you're working in a migrant health center, like I did, I had people that weren't in control of preparing their own food, who got driven on a bus to a grocery store on the weekend, maybe to buy food, and then driven back to a camp many times where they had primitive cooking and not good refrigeration. Um, I and those are social determinants of health, but they're also my personas. So they're, it's, it's connected in. Um, I might've had um, more single moms in one place than another place. I might've had people that spoke a different language in one place compared to another place. Certainly when I worked on the island of Molokai in Hawaii with indigenous Hawaiians, their personas were entirely different than my personas in urban North Carolina environments. Um, my personas in Molokai, Hawaii, were people where there was a huge extended family, and they told me, look, Doc, uh, people, people from our islands are big. Our, we're sumo wrestlers, you know, and like, we like babies this big. And our, um, our archetype of who we saw and what health and wellness meant what access to care they had. They mostly had sustainable food. They fished and they hunted and they had a lot of native plants that they ate, um, but they also had a whole lot of GI food as in um, uh, soldiers. Um, they had from World War II, they had spam. That's when it came in to the islands there. Um, and they had lots and lots and lots of very unhealthy foods that the uh, army imported and that stayed. So um, that's all important as we think about what's sort of our archetype and that's our persona. persona. You're, um, we'd also like you to make a persona. Um, so make a persona of your pediatric population. Think about them um, with your healthcare team. What, what's our persona? And then what about your care teams? Um, who are they? Are they people of the community usually? Um, how many folks on your care team struggle with this as an issue and how do they feel about it? Um, how do they um, uh, respond in their own homes and your own communities? And then who's actually available? Do you have mental health people available on your care team, behavioral health folks that are good with children and families? Do you have um, dental in your care team? Do you have... Um, uh, patient navigators? Do you have community health workers, promotoras? Um, how are you really going to be responsive to this topic as a chronic disease um, or as a prevention topic that's of huge concern to you in, um, in your health center? Who's on that care team with you? One thing that we've really found at NAC is data is often meaningless um, that health centers are gathering. And I don't mean that as a cut and I mean it as the way I meant it in my own work. I didn't know what the percentage of children were that um, had obesity in my practice. Um, I knew it was a lot, but we had never pulled our charts and done a BMI percentage of, you know, this many of our five-year-olds, uh, our two to five-year-olds have a BMI of over 85. This many have it of over 95. So I couldn't actually have told you how big a problem it was statistically. I could have just told you anecdotally. Well, not much changes programmatically without data. So what does your data look like in your health center? Um, and also in your community, what is your community doing around um, pediatric overweight and obesity? Do your schools know? Do they have programs? Um, are, does your hospital know uh, your referral sources? Because uh, data drives demand, drives funding, drives program development. 
And um, it's important to have data that's meaningful and consistent. And then the last thing in the human um, centered design, again, really thinking about you, your care team, your families, your data, when you design an intervention, um, how might you design an intervention that takes into account those things and that is actually going to achieve the goal that you want to achieve. So it's a part of quality improvement. Um, there's different ways to do quality improvement, but this is one way that has been proven successful in um, intervening around healthy weight. We have some examples of personas that we'll share with you at the end of this, uh, personas that were developed for uh, the care teams as well as for the children. And you might look at them later as just a conversation starter with your own care team and say, um, how would this actually change our practice looking at this? Um, how would we change our goals around what we're doing looking at this? Next slide. So we sort of just said that, next slide. So this is another CDC slide that um, just to keep in mind, it's a good handy one for you to have as a summary. Um, we are only gonna talk about evidence-based strategies here, even though that we know all of us do both evidence-based work and um, traditional work, if I'll call it that, that it hasn't necessarily been proven successful, but anecdotally, we, we know that it is. Um, but the evidence-based strategies that work around prevention of obesity and overweight are really looking um, faithfully at BMI measurement and growth charts. And I can't tell you how many times I've corrected those in my own practice from where they were entered wrong. It's really important to get those growth charts cleaned up because they are important tools. And once you show them to your staff that um, often do the plotting and you can explain why it's important, um, I've found that there's better improvement in my growth chart plotting. So once I showed people like, look, this looks makes it look like they have a genetic anomaly and that's important for me to know, like say Turner syndrome um, or failure to thrive, or this makes it look like, oh, maybe they have Crater Willie, which is another kind of genetic syndrome, or this looks like overweight, this looks like a thyroid problem. And once our care team knows that there's usefulness in those growth charts, you'll get better results. Motivational interviewing is absolutely key. We'll have a lot on that, um, but we can't just talk to people about and fat shame or talk about obesity and overweight. That is totally not a successful approach. Um, early childhood nutrition, um, we talked a little bit about data support. So do you get flags that say um, this child is, um, BMI is in the obese range, needs follow-up in three months. Do you have any kind of follow-up based on your data? Most places don't for their BMI data on children. Um, are you doing the 105210 screening? We'll talk about that. Uh, there's a whole slide on that and the SDOH screening. Um, and then how is your mental and behavioral health um, screening tied in with your um, weight screening? Is it tied in? Are they, are they, does one trigger another automatically depending on where that BMI is? And what sort of community supports do you actually have um, stable connections to? Treatment is different. Treatment has um, family-centered lifestyle interventions. And those are intense that I was talking about. They need at least 26 hours um, to be successful is just the number that got pulled. And actually for behavior alone, for behavioral change, it's double that, 52 hours. Um, so you can't do this if you're a clinician by yourself. It's You've got to have a team and you've got to have community support. Um, medications, um, I don't do medications, but some of our colleagues do, again, um, Dr. Reifenberg will be talking to you about that a bit. Subspecialty referrals, but we can't just swap swamp them. There's a long, long waiting um, list for medical weight management and surgical weight management. And we are now doing um, bariatric surgery and children and we didn't use to, but that is something that's being used now. Next slide. Um, this is for 
later reference for you and you can blow it up. What we're going to talk about today is the screening part, zero to 18. But one of the things the CDC wanted us to put together was sort of an algorithm for care. And we realized there's a bunch of algorithms. The AAP has one. They're going to have another one in the fall. And um, again, um, we'll go more intensively into that on uh, module three, which is the medical management. Um, today is more about screening. But we realized that, wow, there is a lot. You can just see how many boxes there are. This is not a simple problem. It is a very complex problem with uh, many different kinds of people that need to be involved. So next slide. This Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna look at that first screening. And, and again, we're saying zero to 18 year old. Um, the AP's guidelines are two to 18. The US Presentative Services Task Force is six um, because of how interventions work. But um, we would like everybody who's um, born to get looked at for healthy weight management. So BMI, obviously, we look at that from age two and up, and um, we want you to have electronic health record supports that are giving flagging you when there's a change in BMI. So has the BMI gone up or down by a certain degree? Do you get a flag uh, that lets you know that? Most places would say no. Um, <clears throat> the 10-5-2-1-0 screening is 10 hours of sleep at night, um, five fruits and vegetables, two hours or less of um, discretionary screen time. Of course, the pandemic just destroyed that. One hour of um, physical activity at least and zero uh, sweetened beverages. Um, and there's a whole um, menu of those things for parents. Um, so those two things are the most evidence-based, the BMI, the 10-5-2-1-0 screening for prevention. Um, you do need to screen for the comorbidities. And of course, if somebody has just a little bit of overweight, but they have some of the comorbidities, let's say asthma, let's say uh, prediabetes, you're gonna be uh, very much more interested in follow-up regularly than if they didn't. And that's something, again, we find that almost hardly anybody is really doing follow-up around weight unless it's into the kind of severe obese range. Um, the SDOH screening, what sort of supports do they have? Food insecurity, the AAP does recommend everybody screen for food insecurity. So how is that related to overweight and obesity? And then um, behavioral screening. Next slide. So birth to 24 months, um, just very briefly, we don't do BMI. <clears throat> but we look at their height for weight and if there's a change in the growth philosophy, velocity. Um, and that's where it's really important to train whoever is doing your height and weight and head circumference in your center, really train them over and over and over and have quality standards, do a QI project on it. It is really important. Um, and children who um, are overweight in this early first two years of life have um, three times the risk of being overweight or obese in early school age. So it's important to catch them when they're little. Um, most of us don't look at Z scores, to be honest. I have to look them up on a chart and figure them out. So I, I don't use Z scores, but most of us look at changes in growth velocity and like, is it trending in an abnormal way? And we'll remeasure them. And, um, and, if it still is, then we know that it, it is an area of concern. Next. So this is actually the easiest thing to do of anything that we do in healthy weight and uh, training, and it's catching them zero to 24 months um, and very simple guidelines. We wanna promote early and continued breastfeeding, and we can see with this formula shortage what a nightmare that is, right? So here's another reason to promote early and continued breastfeeding. We want to promote, and breastfed babies will be a little bit smaller a lot of times than formula-fed babies. Um, we want to promote infant activity, and people don't always think about that. Like, oh, I know that they're supposed to like learn how to roll and lie in their back, have tummy time, but actually that is, it's not just to know how to roll over. We actually want them to be active. So they need a safe place to be active. We also need to promote safe and healthy feeding, which means having them sit 
in a place when they eat. And I don't know how many of you ask parents that question about where the child actually eats. And then healthy feeding, which is responsive feeding. Responsive feeding is watching for hunger cues and feeding the baby then. And then when they're satisfied, not trying to, oh, well, I just have this much of the baby food left in the jar and I hate to waste it. So kind of shoving it in, even though they're spitting it out, that's not what we want to promote. And we want them to um, do self-feeding as early as they can safely. Next slide. So that's not rocket science. It's not hard, um, but many of us don't know those four steps. So for you all, um, how many of you have formal screening and follow-up for zero to 24 year olds? Just give you five seconds to do this. So you have a formal way. It's not just that you individually decide you're gonna do that, but you have actually, you have a protocol. All right, let's see what we got. So most of you don't, 72%. So there's your first improvement project. Work on a formal protocol for how you want to follow a zero to 24 months old who are gaining weight too fast. First, you might actually measure how many 24 month olds are overweight if there's a way that you would be able to figure out to do that. Next. Okay, so um, I don't know if there I can clear that. Um, early childhood education is one of those SDOH things is um, actually has been shown to affect weight. We know that early head start has effects on high school graduation. We've known that for years and years and years. We've known a lot of nice things about um, education and its early effects on childhood. But one of the things I didn't realize is it actually protects against obesity. So um, how it does that is multifactorial, um, healthy nutrition and activity, structured day and learning, opportunity for parents to work and reduce poverty, and reduction in parental stress. The other thing, children, and I work with special needs children who are zero to three, and that eating in a group is great modeling for eating. So our picky eaters get to be better eaters. Our, you know, it's just eating together as a zero to three-year-old and watching other little people eat is um, actually a, a very healthy approach. Um, and that's why we want people at a table, whether they're with their family or whether they're in daycare or whatever, wherever they are, we want those little people at a table eating together with others. Um, but these are stunning. Obesity and cardiovascular disease reduced 30 years after participation in a multi-component early care program. It's pretty stunning. Next slide. So our next steps after we screen, we've done the BMI or we've done the, the zero to two year old, um, or now we're with the two to 18 year old. We've done their BMI and we've charted it and we've seen where they fall on the, on the line. Um, our next step is screening for SDOH, the simple little, I'll come to it next, uh, two question screen for food security is one place to start. And whether they're involved with WIC and whether they um, have transportation to after school activities and what else they, what recreational opportunities they have and screening for family history and comorbidities. I have a whole list of those family history and comorbidities to screen for in our medical management screening for mental and behavioral health issues. Um, those are both induce obesity and then also occur after obesity. So after obesity and overweight, there's a lot of shaming and bullying and that sort of thing that can happen, exclusion um, that leads to mental health problems in children. Um, but particularly maternal mental health problems can lead to obesity in children who weren't obese. Next slide. So if any of you are looking at um, maternal depression and you're relating that to your pediatric health, you might even look at um, and even have your behavioral health people pull the charts of um, moms with depression and see whether their children are falling into an overweight or obese category. They could be a subpopulation of concern for you to start with if you needed a starting point. Um, the 521010, I just wanted you to have this um, link, which you'll have on the slides, 
This is Baton Rouge and they have, um, this is a national idea, but Baton Rouge has this really great curriculum on this and resources. Cause it's one thing to say five fruits and veggies. It's quite another to be able to explain what that means and to know if somebody's food insecure and how they can get these things and whether they're fresh and that sort of thing and whether they're affordable, right? Um, so we can just, again, be talking heads or we can try to be more successful. And Baton Rouge has a great resources and curriculum for that. Next slide. So the screening questions that we want for um, food insecurity, hunger is a vital sign. Um, why are people who are hungry uh, tend to be overweight and obese? Well, because cheap food is often filling and satisfying, and um, that is what is available. And it's also typically very high in fat and high in sugar. So um, it's easy to get um, poor quality food that will make you fat but it won't make you strong and it won't make you healthy. And so the messages that we're trying to give to families is around strength and around health. Not, not you know, so avoiding the, the size thing, but we're worried about whether or not they're getting their vitamins and whether their bones are strong and whether they're gonna be healthy and be able to fight disease. So these two questions are the classic two questions, simple to do within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more, yes or no. Within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last. We didn't have money to get more, yes or no. If you answer the first question, yes. The second question, no. You're at risk for food insecure and you're still considered food insecure. You're absolutely food insecure and high risk um, for problems relating to that if you answer both of them though. Okay, next. So simple question, obviously it's been used lots. Um, hopefully that you all are using that and you could do it on every well child checkup, really. Um, another thing that surprised me, this just came out as I was preparing this, um, 2022 it was in the pediatrics, our you know flagship journal. And it looked at 15 years of normal weight, overweight, obesity, and severe obesity, BMI trajectories, so how they moved over time. And they looked at infancy and early childhood to see um, if what happened, if what you had in infancy, did that predict? And did um, age two to five, or I'm bad at math, whatever that is, did that predict? And um, what they found, it was a majority white population, but it was all poverty levels. So it was wealthy and poor. Um, so it was um, all socioeconomic classes. It included single parents and non-single parents. Um, and, and it included people with maternal depression and without. So they did, they did factor for those issues. And what they found is that um, parental, and this is mostly maternal, it says parental, but the Inventory is mostly maternal. Warmth and responsive to, to, to distress is a family asset that buffers against excess weight. I never would have known that. Um, and um, the other um, protective factors, we always know that educating women is protective for families' health in general. Um, and then this home inventory, you can look up if you want to. It's, it's 45 questions, the short form, so it's not short but it looks at um, the level of stimulation and in, um, in the home. It looks at things like reading to your child, at whether you talk to your child while you're doing stuff, even if they're pre-verbal, um, whether you smile at your child, um, that sort of thing. But that, um, that home kind of interaction was also protective against obesity. So if you do home, visits, um, they can be rich. And I would suggest if you do home visits, look up that home inventory and maybe adapt it for your use because it is it will show protection against future obesity and overweight. Next slide. So um, what tools do you all use? You can just put it in the chat. And I'm gonna keep going. And what resources do you actually have around food insecurity, particularly around community engagement, the built environment, looking at the home? And next slide, Liz, while they do that. And while you're doing that in the chat, um, 
we're going to do this every um, every session, but we really want people because this is can be an overwhelming um, problem, an overwhelming idea, and you know I'm only touching screening today. We have five modules. This we could have ten. This is a such an enormous problem, and it can feel very defeating. So I told you it can take 26 to 52 hours, right, for a real intensive lifestyle management program that includes the family, that includes the clinician somehow in follow-up, that includes um, behavioral health, and it includes recreation. It includes a lot. So you're trying to prevent needing to get to that point, but even if you do need to get to that point, for every module, just think about, well, I, I don't have 26 hours, but you do have a minute. So what can you do in a minute, right? Maybe you can look up the home inventory. Maybe you can have a conversation with your QI person on, can we figure out what the rate of childhood overweight and obesity is in our population? Um, that's a one minute question you can ask, right? Um, what can you do in five minutes? Um, maybe you can uh, call back three of your families that are really at that overweight, obese, and they also have maternal stress. And you might call them to come in for another appointment or for just talk to them over the phone. 15 minutes is our usual clinic visit, right? So what can you do in a 15 minute office visit? We talked about the um, 521010, I get the numbers all out of order but they're all there. Um, you can do that in your 15 minute thing and you can use those Baton Rouge resources and you can give them to them or you can call a dietitian, right? And then the 26 hours, we actually have some really good examples from health centers that we'll share with you that can happen in those. So we're trying real hard to figure out at every stage, what can you do? Um, because it's gonna take all of us and it's gonna take all of us all the time to um, have an effect on this. Next slide. So I told you some of the possibilities to get started in your centers, just to take a baby step, um, measure those rates, um, test a screening tool for food insecurity. If you use the Hager one, great. Test and see what, what how many of your families are and of those, how many of the families are overweight or obese. Do a quality improvement test on your growth charts. How well are they matching out? You know, I, I just got to tell you, ours were terrible until we did a quality improvement. They were just, you could not trust them. And then um, develop staff and patient personas. That would take you 15 minutes. Wouldn't take a lot longer than that probably. And it's a little bit of fun to do if you do it with a team. Next slide. So our next module is expanding on this and actually choosing a tasty menu because you'll realize I didn't talk about bias and stigma, which is enormous, or how to communicate or how to do motivational interviewing and no examples. Um, so we are gonna talk about that, but we're gonna take a few questions now. What's the next slide? Because I can't see it. Yeah, so we do have resources for you. And um, Sarah is also gonna talk to you about the next slide, which is um, for those of you that want CME credit and you'll get five credits at the end of this, or you'll get one for each hour that you participate. So it, um, you, you can get anywhere from one to five, but um, I'm gonna ask Sarah to let me know um, what we're seeing in the chat box. All right. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Sorry, we got a little bit of background. One second. There we go. Um, okay. Um, the one question we have uh, that has come up is uh, where might I find a list of comorbidities that you screen for? Is there any specific resource for that? I'm not the best at technology, but um, yes, if you will stay tuned, uh, we have a whole slide of comorbidities and what you're supposed to do depending on which one. So how you approach lipid control and that sort of thing. Um, but on that, I did a brief list of them on one of the slides in this handout um, that uh, I don't know if you can skip back to Liz or not, but it was on the one that had the six blocks on it. And um, I did put in the comorbidities on that. It's way back in like slide four or five or six, somewhere in there. 
keep going back, 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 back. There, chronic health comorbidities. Whoops, you were there. Nope, stop. Chronic health comorbidities, so asthma, depression, anxiety, that, I, that is the list. Um, and um, the, that's the sort of an exhaustive list. The less exhaustive list, which algorithms tend to pay attention to is fatty liver, hypertension, uh, diabetes, those are the three we pay attention to the most. Sleep apnea is probably the fourth, but all of those do have um, comorbidities with obesity. What else is there? All right. Uh, there's no other questions at this time. I'll talk about CMEs real quick while you all get some more questions in there. Um, again, CMEs, uh, we uh, were granted CMEs to the AFP. Uh, so if you're a uh, family uh, physician or um, a anyone from the lists uh, below that have affiliation to the AAFP, um, you will be able to fill out um, a survey. And as uh, Jenny shared with you, you'll be able to get uh, one credit hour per, um, per module uh, that you attend. Um, you'll be getting a survey link um, right after this. So when you Close your Zoom, you'll be going directly uh, to the survey. So please fill it out um, that way. Um, and then um, we'll be giving um, the credits for that. Um, we have some registered dietitians on there. Um, that unfortunately is not on the list, uh, but what you could do is fill out the survey. We'll give you a certificate. And if you would like to submit that to your governing body um, for uh, dietitians, you can certainly um, try out there. Um, we do have a question. Um, will school lunch issues be covered this week? Um, I guess what, it's not what today. They, what do they mean? What issue would you like to say about school lunch? And okay, unhealthy options. Yeah, so that is a good policy advocacy thing. So in your 15 minutes or even five minutes, you can write a letter to your school board, to your um to your superintendent, you can get in touch with your state Congress people. Um, I know that in my state, which is Washington, we've done a whole lot around, we have a lot of schools have gardens where the kids grow food and then they eat it. And um, we've gotten rid of soda machines in our schools, um, including our high schools. That was a hard sell um, and including Gatorade and all those drinks, um, all sweetened beverages. So um, you can definitely do that around school lunches. Um, I will say school lunches are way healthier than they used to be in general, but you have to look at your own district and see what they're having, but that is a great place to be an advocate. Um, also, um, somebody asked about the red zone. Can you, what, what was the question? Uh, the question is, sorry. Okay. I'm uh, children five and up in the red zone. How often do you follow once a year, four times a year? How often? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I do quarterly and um, uh, again, we're gonna have some guests who do obesity clinic all the time in community health centers and for children and they may have different answers for you. But um, if I'm concerned about a child's weight, um, I bring them back anywhere from one month to three months, depending on a number of factors, uh, not just their weight, but family stress, um, excitement, well-being, um, comorbidities. Um, I've even had kids come back a week later, not to weigh them, but to have uh, interventional time, supportive time and motivational inter interviewing. And so we'll talk about that too. You don't actually have to weigh kids all the time. That can be a problem. Um, so we want to approach them around the topic of health. And next session, um, we will go into great detail on bias and stigma and the right words to use and how to um, help them. I'm glad that some of you at least are saying thank you. Um, we want this to be great. It, it does take multiple presentations. So I feel a little bad that I keep saying we're gonna get to that, but this is really just like a broad overview. Like I said, we're setting the table. We're saying, come to this table and this is what's gonna be served. We're only letting you see the menu today. Um, so we will serve you deeply as we come up. 
Oh, thanks, Rick. That means a ton from you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next week. Same time, same place.